Okay. Great. So welcome, everybody. As I mentioned, my name is Fadi, and I'm the uh, executive director and co-founder of Venture to Impact. Um, and we'd like to welcome you all to this session on fundraising effectively, uh, specifically online, and learning about the best uh, fundraising tools. Uh, I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. So as we gather in this virtual space, we recognize that we're connected with one another through a variety of different ways. And we acknowledge that the ground beneath our feet is historically the home of indigenous peoples. V2I operates at Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and traditional lands of Mi'kmaq people. And now I'm zooming in from Kitchener, Ontario, the traditional home of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and neutral people. If you know the land you're joining us from today, please let us know in the chat. And if you don't know where you're joining us from, but you'd like to learn, I am happy to share this resource in the chat that might support you on your learning journey. Um, a quick introduction about us at V2Y and uh, about Brock, and then I will pass it on to Brock to take it away to this session. So, um, as you might know, Venture to Impact is a, is a charity organization that uses human-centered design and design thinking methodologies to solve complex challenges. And we do that by linking global communities to skilled volunteers. And we are so privileged to be working with such an a, array of amazing partners who support us on a regular basis in the connection and tool development and um, education work that we do, specifically to connect stakeholders from the corporate sector um, and the nonprofit sector to solve complex problems. Today's guest, I'll let him introduce himself in a second. I saw he has a slide in his deck, so I'm not gonna repeat, but uh, yeah, just really excited to bring uh, my good friend Brock into this conversation today. Brock is a fundraising expert and a best-selling author uh, that talks all about this topic. So we're going to uh, go into this topic a little bit more in a second, uh, but yeah, today's agenda is really talking about fundraising, what you need to know, what works and what doesn't and why, and then we'll open it up for a Q&A. And at the end, closing is really just a five minute for you to do a quick survey to let us know how this session went uh, so we can make sure that um, our learning um, sessions in the future are tailored to the feedback that we receive. What should you expect to learn today? Um, a high level understanding of the major digital fundraising channels and their primary purposes, an understanding of which digital channels will help you raise the most money, why this is true, and how to start building or optimizing the program. The building blocks of a sustainable email fundraising program, plus one on that, super keen on hearing Brock's thought on that one because uh, yeah, just really curious about uh, how we can uh, leverage email because it's super scalable and it, it can create a lot of nurture journeys to the donors that, that we're targeting. So Brock, um, I'm, I'm really keen to, to hear all about that. And then how to design a manageable, scalable social media plan that supports your fundraising efforts. I feel like manageable and scalable are very tough to achieve. So again, I'm uh, really curious about those things. So um, without further ado, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and pass it off to Brock, um, who can start sharing his and I will spotlight you. So over to you, Brock. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm calling in from Prince Edward County, Ontario, which if you've been, it's a really beautiful area. And if you haven't been, please 
come visit. I'd love to see you. I have uh, put together a pretty packed agenda today, so I'm gonna I'm gonna jump right in. I'll I'll just do as as promised. Brief introduction myself. So I co-own a company called Broccoli. We're a specialized consulting nonprofit, quite new actually. Uh, well, while I've been working in this space for about uh, going on 15 years pretty soon, I uh, am fairly new to the consulting space and having a blast doing it. We do work from innovation consulting and support for organizations who are really trying to shake things up, uh, right to some very traditional direct response fundraising tactics that look like email, direct mail, uh, and campaign design. So I uh, co-host, I co-founded this with my, my business partner, Holly Pollan. She's also got about 15, actually probably closer to 20 years experience. And uh, yeah, together we're, we're trying to help charities just do more and hopefully not by asking them to do a whole lot more. We're really trying to provide some support. I, this is my full-time job. I also teach part-time at Humber College, the business school in the digital fundraising class. And uh, like Fatih alluded to, I also wrote a book called From the Ground Up, Digital Fundraising for Nonprofits, which is uh, released last year, but has continued to sell quite consistently. And I'll, I'll, I've thrown a little slide in at the end in case you're curious what it looks like and need to write that name down again. But today, we've got quite a bit to get through. I understand the, the interest and the excitement about trying to walk away with expertise in every one of these areas, but the honest truth, I'll tell you right off the top, is that there's uh, never enough time to really cover all these things. At Humber College, I, for what, what is going to be one section here that we have allocated 15 minutes to, I teach multiple classes on, and it still feels like I'm only scratching the surface. So what I really hope is that we've set you off in the right direction, provided a whole bunch of extras here at the end, you can see, and also happy to stay connected as well. If you, um, my, my contact information is at the end of this presentation. So even though it's on YouTube, feel free, give me, give me a shout. <clears throat> you can also find me on Twitter, Brock Warner. So today we, we are gonna fly through four big areas of digital fundraising. We're gonna talk about channels, the purpose, we're gonna move right into what are some of those building blocks uh, whether you are brand new and getting started or you're a more established organization, I hope there's something for everyone to take away. We are going to dedicate some time to sustainable email marketing because that really is where the fundraising conversions happen. And social media is something that everybody wants a little guidance, support, tips and tricks. And so I'm going to talk through some very avoidable mistakes that you can take away from this session. And then we've also got a Q&A and a discussion the end. I have adapted this presentation from what was a three-hour hands-on workshop. So I've uh, moved everything that I didn't think we quite had time to talk through into the extras section. And so you'll see that there's, there's about as many extras as there are slides in the actual presentation. And um, I've got a copy with Fatty so he can share with anybody who needs it, distribute after as long as well as with the video. During this presentation, feel free to turn off your video if you like, whether it's early or late there, I understand, I get it. I'm looking mainly at my slides, so I'm not going to notice whether or not your camera is on or not. If I've missed something that's really important, you feel free, please, just, just hop in. Uh, but you can also use the chat, Fatih's here, he might be able to troubleshoot a small issue if you have one. I'm also happy to repeat something that I may not have been clear about. And we do have 30 minutes for Q&A at the end. So I wanna hear all of your questions. I wanna have that discussion. And if you think it's something that doesn't have to be corrected or discussed amidst the presentation, then it might be great for the Q&A. And I'd love to hear it then. Now let's, let's jump right in. Channels. We're gonna go through four digital fundraising channels here right off the top. You've heard of them all. I just want to make sure that we're all speaking the same language and sharing the same definition. Email first. Email is a push channel, which is that you've got control and you're pushing it out to your audience. It's pretty effective because you can control the timing and the content. And there's a lot of customization and personalization that you could put into your emails, which is only going to help build trust and feel like uh, you're, you're giving a very relevant, timely, and personal 
appeal or update or invitation to the people that you're sending to in a way that you can't with social media because social media it's a one-to-many conversation and you couldn't have things like a merge field you can't insert a first name in there good morning brock da, 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 da. you can't you can't do that unfortunately on twitter just because brock follows your account so email is great and i'm starting with it because it's it's the place where your direct solicitations of individuals and your thanking of them will be most personalized and relevant. <clears throat> Social is very, very important to your cause. Uh, it's not necessarily going to be where the bulk of your fundraising happens, but what it does very well is it's great for community building, discussion, organizing, all of which are critical to achieving your mission. As a fundraising tool, it's probably gonna raise the most amount of money, not directly and not necessarily by being processed inside the platform, like inside Twitter, inside Facebook, inside Instagram, chances are it's going to direct people to the place where they give, which is likely going to be your website. So it's those great posts, it's those well-timed, well-targeted advertisements or really rich engaging video content, which is going to send people to the place where they give. The primary purpose of this is real-time communication with your community. Next is search. So these are this is Google, Ask Jeeves, Alta Vista, Bing. <laughs> the your your every search engine. What it fundamentally does is it allows people to search for content related specifically to your charity. Now there's there's a lot that's there's there are sessions and honestly probably degrees and certifications entirely in understanding how you can get your website to the top of search results but fundamentally it's helping people find you if your website is fairly well written and fairly much kept up to date it's going to help people find you when they search for you and then ultimately what they're getting to is your is your website and your website is the place where you make your case if people are researching this is where you want them to go and if you get them there you want them to have all of the information they need so that they think you're accountable and trustworthy they understand what you're doing because if you can answer all of those questions you'll have lined up all the dominoes you need to eventually fall to that donation you're looking for at the end and even if you don't get that donation you're looking for at the end you would hope they're engaged enough that they might sign up for your email list so that you can welcome them and you can steward them, you can educate them more, and then they might be at the right time and the right place in their life ready to give. And now, if I were to vastly simplify the, the ways in which people make their way to a donation, I really think that at the center is the website. That's what you're seeing here. At the center is the website because that's where your donations are going to be processed. Search is pushing people in there. Now your website can push people back and forth between social. Social might send people to your website and your website might send people to your social media channels. Either direction is fine because it's, a, it's an indication of engagement. Likewise with email, your website might send people to the email list to subscribe and be welcomed and learn more. Uh, and your email list, if they've been able to get on there at this point, uh, your email might be the way in which you build the relationship to the point that when you send them to the website, they'll make a donation. And I've, I put a dotted line here between email and social because I think that there's a an often missed opportunity to use your social channels to su promote subscription to your your email list. And there are people subscribed to your email list who might really uh, find your content on your social media channels really engaging. So I think these two can play off one another. But that relationship, that dotted line vertical relationship I've shown here, is not necessarily going to raise you more money right off the bat. But I think it all it all uh, the ecosystem works best when all these pieces are in harmony with one another. Got a, a little uh, diagram that I made here that I find really helpful when making the case for email marketing as the place to raise money. And that's because often, sometimes boards, I don't want to throw boards under any buses, but sometimes boards, sometimes just uh, skilled volunteers or the, your donors themselves might say that, well, social, you got to get on social, but we got to raise money. So we need to get on social. I would say, actually, if you need to raise money, you need to get your email house in order first. Now, email marketing is a little, has a little steeper of a learning curve because you have platforms, you have customizations you might have, you need to verify domains and so on. So there's a little more of a learning curve, but the potential for fundraising is high. And that's why it's in the upper right 
quadrant here of this chart. Social media, very easy to use. It's very easy to use, but it can also be really challenging to raise money there. You can raise money there, but it is a little trickier. You're going to be pushing a little larger of a boulder up a steeper hill. And search, website, text, and SMS. We're going to spend a little less time today in this session talking about those. Um, but if you're curious about them, we have some work in the some homework and some resources in the uh, extras section of this presentation. And also re reach out. Happy to talk about it. And we, we promised some building blocks. We just went through four. I want to pause for a moment and maybe in the chat, I, I'm going to, I'm posing a question here. Maybe you've heard this one before, but if not, I'd love to hear it in the chat. Lego blocks. This is a four by two Lego brick. The, the official, officially they're called bricks. They're not blocks. So Lego brick, this four by two Lego brick. If I were to have four or six of these Lego bricks, like this, if I were to have six of these Lego bricks, how many unique ways do you think I could combine them? As in like how many unique structures do you think there could be? If you've, uh, if you've got a second, pop it in the chat. I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on this. I'm gonna jump right to it. I'm also um, not able to see the chat at this moment. I trust you're all very, very close. I'm gonna give you all the benefit of the doubt. You're very, very close. The number is 915,103,760. Unique structures can be built from just those six Lego blocks, four by two Lego blocks. And I'm not a mathematician, very far from it. So I've linked the documentation down below if you're curious. And uh, that math has been verified and accepted by the Lego Corporation, the mothership. So why do I share that? I share that little math fact because we're talking about a few building blocks here. And I don't want you to take away any sort of, oh my gosh, misdirection or mis, um, misunderstanding that just because we're talking about a few building blocks means it's easy or it means that there's some simple way to do this. There are many, many ways to connect and play one channel off another and customize a journey and experience for your charity, uh, for your donors, sorry, within your your charity or nonprofit or even social impact organization of any kind. There's so many different ways that you could build a journey and you shouldn't feel confined by email, search, social. You shouldn't feel the need to chase new platforms and new strategies and new tactics necessarily. You've got quite a bit to work with right under your nose. So for example, here's three. We've got your website, which is great for capturing interest, capturing information so that you can continue conversations. You've got email, which is great for conversion, converting to donor, converting to monthly donor, converting to volunteer, uh, converting to event attendee and participation in other ways. There's lots that you can use email for, and it's great for converting. And then you've got social. Social is incredible for building community, which is going to be vital for your nonprofit to grow, being able to take advantage of network effects, your friends of friends of friends, and to grow outward. Social is great for that. Now, what goes into each one of those? Start with website. If websites are Lego blocks, these are like the little nubs on top of the Lego block. If you want donations, you need to make it easy for people to find your donation form. If you're a charity right now, I suspect you have a donation form. I'm not going to assume that it's easy to find. Upper right-hand corner is a really common place to put it. I think if you can put it there, fantastic. As long as it is above the fold, though, that is to say, as long as people don't have to scroll down on your page to find your donation button, then I think you're, you're, you're well on your way. A simple sign up form for emails. Uh, so often, so often email sign up forms get buried in the footer. And I could speculate why. I have my own personal theories why. I'm going to keep this myself because I, I don't have data to support it. I know this is going on YouTube. I don't want, a, I don't want any developers or professional marketers hand hand to be uh, to, think, to get the wrong idea. But sometimes email sign up forms are an afterthought and they end up very far down in the page, if at all. We want them prominent, we want them up top. And I'm gonna show you a couple examples of how that looks like. If that form that you've just put on your site, let's integrate it with your email tool. Don't let it just send to a Google Sheets or to an Excel online spreadsheet. Let's, let's use a form that maybe is created by your email platform so that as soon as somebody signs up, it is 
immediately into your email tool because we're gonna be able to, and we'll, we'll talk about this a little more in a minute, we're gonna be able to then automate a journey that kicks off after. And we wanna link out to our, our social media channels. There, there are certainly varying degrees of engagement that we'd like. We want donations right up at the top, but sometimes uh, assuming somebody's gonna give a donation after their first visit to your website is a bit like thinking you're gonna get married after the first date. It's not always going to happen. So we want the donation, we may not get it. So then we would like an email sign up we may not get it. If they could go to your Twitter page, Facebook page, Instagram or elsewhere and like it, I'll take it, I'll take it. But we do want those donations first. Now email, email is great for conversion. So here are a few pieces that you could put in place. I recommend you put in place so that you really set yourself up for success. A subscriber welcome series. A subscriber is not a donor. So these would be people who just gave you their email and they they want to learn more and they want to they want to engage. So almost every platform, every every substantial and reputable email platform has the ability to create automated journeys. Pricing may be different, but they're all there. I think it's well worth the investment if you can find it in your your marketing or communications budget to make sure you have the plan to enable automated journeys. Now you can welcome in those subscribers and a two or three stage might look like just giving them a little more information about the charity and then letting them know what to expect in future communications. When a person donates, you have a whole new opportunity to welcome them in and you can tell them about the impact of their donation, the progress of your work, and then you could potentially set them up for a monthly donation ask if they really want to improve their, their impact and expand that. And email schedules that are consistent are, are often the most effective. They're often the ones that grow. And I know that I'm stating the obvious likely for everyone on this call, but honestly, it's, um, it's, a, it's not easy. It is easier said than done to have a schedule and to maintain it consistently. I own my own company, I'm gonna admit here on the record, I haven't sent an email in a few weeks. <laughs> I, need, I, need, I need to get better at it because it's hard work. And then look for the ability to A-B test in your platform. So there, there's a lot of platforms out there but not all of them make it incredibly easy for you to A-B test. I don't think that if, you're, if your program is struggling to be even consistent, I don't think you need to get too distracted by the ability to test. But simple A-B testing is gonna help you incrementally learn a little bit more about what gets the slightly higher engagement, slightly higher click-through, slightly higher opens, and you can use that information every subsequent time you send an email to just improve bit by bit by bit. And over time, you might be surprised at where you've landed. And then social. So social is an opportunity to share some very personal stories. The best social media profiles put faces, tell great stories, and make people feel like they're part of a community. If there's no names and faces and stories, it doesn't feel like community. It feels like a big major city newspaper where you don't recognize anyone. It's an opportunity also to curate relevant content. You don't have to feel constrained by only the content you create and produce. There's an opportunity to find relevant content to what the work here is you're doing and the interests of your subscribers and followers and curate that for them and share it to them. That's valuable. That's going to keep them engaged. You can promote your email signups here, some cross promotion. And there's also an opportunity to test some live interactive tools. We're live right now. I think that's fantastic. Congrats, Fatty. You're doing it. Here's an example of website for capture. I love Amnesty International, and you can see that they've got their sign up form right down here in the above the fold, but in the bottom left. It's even right before donate now and it's before act now. You can also see that their donate button, uh, another donate button is right up here in the top navigation. Here's another example of Bernie Sanders campaign who are uh, fans of Bernie or not. He was a his campaigns were very effective at engaging people online, capturing information and raising a lot of small donations from many, many people. I did a deep dive onto this a few years ago and listened to like every, every podcast his digital team was on, every article they wrote, I read it. And they went through literally hundreds of AB landing page tests to find out what converted best. How many fields should they be asking for? What is mandatory? What is not? Is it Bernie? Is it pictures of crowds? Is it Bernie with crowds? You, you name it. They went through all sorts of them. And so 
well, I don't know if the Bernie page is still, I'm sure some Bernie page is active. Political campaigns, if you want some inspiration for landing page conversion, when campaign time runs around, visit all the parties' pages incognito and, and see, it, what, see what they're doing and uh, take some inspiration from that. Emails for conversion. I've dropped in here, I won't read them for you, but I've dropped in two interesting examples of organizations, one Canadian, one American, of welcoming people in and the type of content you could provide them. Canadian Red Cross here is providing access to something that very likely already existed and is already being maintained, but may not been an, of, um, understood or known by the donors. It's sharing this way for them to engage with the impact in, in different ways. It's a data platform. And another one is, might just be welcoming people and then giving them other ways to connect. So you're taking that person who might be an email only member of your community and let's let's see if they want to be an email and Facebook and Instagram member of your community. And then social for community, what can that look like? I've grabbed a few really I think great examples. Act AIDS Committee of Toronto, they're sharing a book club. So they they very likely I, I don't I haven't confirmed this with them directly, but what's possible is that they know that some of their members or maybe some of their most engaged members are readers. And so how can we support and build community amongst those readers? A big gay book club, big gay book club for guys into guys. I think it sounds like a lot of fun, good on them. And I hope that what it's doing is building community for them. I suspect it is. Time's up in the middle here. This is a chance to share hashtags. Hashtags can gather new people in and you could build a community conversation around a hashtag. There's a lot of hashtags. There's also a lot of science testing and uh, opportunities with hashtags that could take a, a session in itself. Canadian Red Cross in the upper right, telling a story of a volunteer. I think it's great. There's a name, there's a face, there's also a location. I think this is a great way to tell stories and give a personal face. And then a bottom right-hand corner example there, kids help phone. Here's an example of curating relevant content. So I suspect they're very bright people at kids help phone. I suspect they probably know that uh, climate is a very important cause to young people. And so sharing that content and sending them to earthday.org, another charity is I think a, a great use of your platform in this case. Now, if you're just getting started, I think there's probably people on this call, I believe there's people on this call from organizations of all different sizes and shades. If you are one of those people who are feel like you just don't know where to get started and you haven't yet organized your thoughts, a simple tool that I really like is an OGSM model, which stands for objectives, goals, strategies, and measures. You may not set your five-year organizational strategy in this way, but I think if you're a, uh, shop that is strapped for time and you may be spinning a lot of plates, this might be a way that in a morning you could knock this out and have something to work to for the next six to 12 months. What it looks like at a really high level is objectives are words. So what does success look like? Describe it in words. Your goals, you're gonna get quantitative. What quantitative targets would you need to achieve to achieve, make that objective a reality? <clears throat> Excuse me, next is strategy. So the strategy is and now back to qualitative. We're gonna use words to describe what actions you need to take to get to those goals to fulfill that objective. And then finally measures is the most granular quantitative measures again. What might that look like? So if an objective is that we wanna cultivate and grow our email marketing list so that we can expand our network of supporters and meet our annual fundraising targets, some goals that might make that possible could be a 25% growth in your email list quarterly to 2023. It could be 25% of annual giving revenue coming from e-appeals if it's not already. How are you going to do that though? A strategy could be utilize and optimize a drip email strategy, which is an automated strategy. You can deliver e-appeals consistently with a high degree of personalization, consistently being the easier said than done piece there. And then how you might measure if those strategies are actually uh, delivering on, on the goals and therefore the objectives is the percentage growth in net email subscribers quarterly, the percentage change in annual giving revenue from e-appeals. These are all 
very possible. I think they are very achievable. And I think that if you were, if these resonate as activities that you would like to see done in your charity, I think, I think you can, you can do these and there are tools that will support you along the way. Email. Time check. I think we're good. I wanted to make sure I had time for email. So let's hop into it. Back to this, this metaphor of building blocks. We covered, we covered three earlier. So here's, here's three more. Look at that. Look at us coming up on six, six building blocks. List growth is one. I think list growth gets, doesn't get enough attention in the nonprofit space. There's a lot of assumption that lists just grow or people will just come. But actually list growth takes some very intentional thought and actions and strategies to make sure that it doesn't get missed as a goal. We do want to grow the list. Marketing of any type, and it's certainly true for fundraising, is a, is a funnel-shaped uh, process to be managed. You need, you need a lot of people joining at the beginning so that in the middle you can gain some further engagement and interaction so that at the bottom of that funnel, what you might have are donors who have converted. You are never going to have 100% conversion of your list because people have entire lives that they're living. Shocking. They have, li they have lives they're living. They have jobs that they are getting or losing. Children that they're having. Uh, children who might need tuition paid. You just, you just never know. So you're not going to hit everybody all the time. You're going to be able to, you're going to need to just be consistent. Make sure that list is always growing and people will convert over time if you ask. So let's just make sure that it's prominent on your website. Talked about this already. Get your database and your email linking. So let's say you use MailChimp. By no means does MailChimp have a monopoly on this, but it is familiar to many people. If you're using MailChimp, when you create a list, you can also create a form. And when you create that form, you can link people directly to it, or you can create an embed code or you can generate a snippet of code that can be embedded onto your website. And then it can be dropped in quite easily, just about anywhere on your website that you want that to appear. If you're not the person who manages your website or website design changes, send that snippet of code to the person who is and just let them know that, hey, I'd, I'd really like to have this form appearing in a prominent place near the top of the website, say, or um, upper third. And I, I suspect it won't be too much of a lift for them. Don't, don't convince yourself that what you're asking them to do is thousands of dollars of development work or change. You should cross promote on social and you should try if at all possible to incentivize sign up. So take stock of what you have that might be of value, but of no additional cost to you to your supporters. Uh, for example, I'm working with a client right now who works in the homelessness space in Ontario, and we've generated an Ontario tenant rights fact sheet. So we've compiled trusted resources, put them in a very like digestible, easy to use, one page sheet, double-sided, and it's a PDF that someone could stick on their fridge that they might wanna provide to clients in their organization. Uh, they might wanna send it to their students, depending on uh, the level of school. And it compiles knowledge that was already existing in the organization. They're experts in this space. And through conversation, I think they took for granted how much they were experts in this space. So creating that one pager, putting it on a landing page, which by the way, MailChimp to use one last time, also has the ability to, to make a landing page that can collect emails. So the landing page encourages people, provide your email, you'll receive this one pager, and then they'll kick off to a one page welcome series where they'll have the ability to opt out, but you'll at least be able to fill that first offer and positioned well, you might keep them on the list. Your content calendar, what should go in that content calendar that we mentioned earlier? I think bare minimum, plan for a monthly e-newsletter. Your monthly e-newsletter is not going to be how you raise money, but it is a very tried and true proven way to communicate information and to remind your supporters that you are still working hard, you still exist, activity is still happening. So your monthly e-newsletter could be a bit of a kitchen sink email. If you're in a bigger organization like I have in the past, you're going to have all sorts of different things that you need to promote. Not all of them deserve their own standalone email a new cause marketing partnership, 5% uh, of this certain product. You may not 
need or want to do that as a standalone email, but as one of six featured stories in your monthly e-newsletter, I think that's a, that's a great place for it. So once you have those monthly e-newsletters in place, seasonal appeals for a year, stick them in there, plan for them, think about in advance about what the story is you're going to tell, but try to just think of it as seasonal once, once every quarter, spring, summer, winter, fall. A special appeal. A special appeal is going to be that fifth one that is going to be a, a bit of a wild card for your organization. Depending on if you are an environmental organization, that might be an Earth Day appeal. Other organizations, you're going to have different days, uh, different weeks, and you're going to want to take advantage of that. I recommend for at least one fundraising ask. So plan for a special appeal. That's number five. And then right around the corner at the time of recording this, November 18th, uh, Giving Tuesday this year falls on November 30th. Giving Tuesday is a great way to kick off the year end season. Uh, for some organizations, it's a great way to acquire new donors, depending on what their ask is and how far in advance they plan. But if nothing else, it's a chance to get the giving season kicked off early. Uh, rather than waiting for some of those people who give at year end on December 30th, Giving Tuesday might be the reminder they need to give on November 30th so that they don't have to spend New Year's Eve with their punching their credit card number into your website, which I'll take, by the way. Nothing, nothing wrong with that. But if you get them started a little earlier, it's going to give you a little peace of mind and you might actually be able to spend a little time with your, your family and friends over the holidays. Now, automation. I, I don't think that there's much or there's rarely resistance to the idea of automation. Where I hear resistance is I just don't know what to say. I don't know what to tell people when I welcome them in. Well, your first, besides saying thank you, to just tell them what to expect. Tell them they're going to get a monthly e-newsletter. They're going to find more opportunities to support this work. Um, and that you're going to you're going to bring them along on this journey. You can ask them to join us on other platforms as well. You could give them a survey, quick, simple survey, gets them doing something, helps them feel engaged. If you're going to give them a survey, please act on act on the information. Don't just don't ask for anything. Uh, my my advice, speaking only on myself, don't ask them for anything if you're not going to action it in some way. Uh, and then you can also put your conversion asks in there. Now, what this might look like if you're a visual person like me is. A subscriber welcome series is they sign up for their email. You're going to share two or three emails, like I just, uh, you know, gave you a few examples there, and then they're going to drop right into your ongoing content calendar. Now, let's say they give a donation, then that might kick off the new donor welcome series. They might, they might have received three emails over three weeks in the email sign up. Now they're going to receive three emails over the the next three weeks as a new donor. And then if you're feeling you know, really, really ambitious, or maybe after a, a year of your new donor welcome series, ticking along and gathering insights and teaching you a little bit about what's working and what's not, then you might, you might want to incorporate a monthly donation ask into your welcome series that kicks off a monthly donor welcome series. I don't think that you, if you are doing none of this, I don't think you need to sit down and feel like you need to plan this entire ecosystem of automation and engagement. I think starting here is going to get you confident with the tool that it is that you're using. It's going to start to show you over time what people are engaging with and what they're not. You might find that email number two gets absolutely no engagement. And so you want to rewrite email number two. I would say if you just write this one series first, cut your teeth here, and then you'll start to fold those learnings into here where you'll start this process all over again, because in the first one, you're just trying to figure out what, what maintains engagement and minimizes unsubscribes. Here, you're gonna be testing potentially messaging to see what converts people well, and you'll fold that into your monthly donation series. There's a lot of work here. There's a year of work easily on this screen. And there's some questions. Oh, I've... I, I've managed these calendars for years and years, and the when it works best, it's because we've asked some very specific questions right at the outset, like who is the audience? It is not always going to be your entire list. 
it might actually be a segment of your list. But if it is your entire list, you should still ask this question because knowing as best you can who they are, what motivates them, how did they get here, what do they expect from us? These are all incredibly important questions to shape the tone, the length, the look and the feel, the brand of your communications. So simple, seemingly simple question, but incredibly important. You should be asking, what are you asking them to do? The monthly e-newsletter might be the one exception where you have to just accept that this is us providing the kitchen sink of updates. But if you need them to do something, you need to get very, very clear about what it is you're asking them to do, which includes telling them very, very clearly where they take action. So just throwing out there, like help us on Earth Day this, this year uh, may not be enough if what you actually want them to do is to register for a local event on the landing page that you just created. You need to be very explicit about what you want them to do. And a time constraint is incredibly important. If you don't tell them when this needs to be done, you've lessened your chances that they're going to take the action that you want them to do. Think critically about why are you asking them? Why, why now? Because if you don't, if you can't answer this question for yourself, then your time and energy might be best spent elsewhere. So consider, why are you asking them to take this specific action, donation or non-financial ask? Think clear about and hard about why. And then you should ask yourself what data or intelligence makes you confident that this is the, the right direction, the right ask on the right timeline at the right location, what data or intelligence makes you confident that this is the right direction? Did any platform that you're using has probably shown you engagement metrics. You probably also have donation metrics um, that you might be able to sort into time and campaigns. You might think you have no data, but I suspect you, you very likely do. And if you have no data, that is data. No data is data because often it could be pointing you still in a direction of uh, the fact that what you have done did not work. Okay, we are, we are just like, we're gonna just keep rolling right along into social. F Fatty has, has not stopped me. So I'm assuming that there's nothing. Uh, totally no, I think totally you're good. And uh, what I was gonna say is if people have questions, they can drop them in the chat um, or unmute yourselves and you can ask and we can we can have a dynamic conversation but we're also we've also carved out a lot of time for a q a so if we take some of that if people don't have questions and roll into content that's okay too so uh, yeah if people on the line have any thoughts questions comments uh feel free to uh, chime in um, however you feel comfortable and and we'll uh we'll have the conversation with you about that so Rock, back to you. All right. Social. Let's talk about social media. There, are, you know, so I, th I thought this might be an interesting way to approach this, to talk about avoidable mistakes. Mistakes I've made. I've made all these mistakes. I've learned, learned the hard way. And now I want to share with you because they are, they are all avoidable. I thought this might be a different way to approach the how-to. So, hope so. Uh, one overvaluing vanity metrics, such an avoidable mistake. What do I mean by vanity metrics? So vanity metrics over on the, the left. These are impressions, likes, and your number of followers, shares, comments, open rates, views, traffic, time on site, bounce rate, and more. These are very easy to access metrics. They also, in some cases, like impressions, are huge numbers. And that's, that's awesome. Like it's, it feels very good. It's a quick hit of warm, fuzzy adrenaline, ego stroke, call it what you want, when you can point to a very large number in your reports. But if it's not linked to some sort of conversion that is meaningful to fulfilling the work that it is you're trying to do, which like might be a, a donation. It, it also might be a writing a letter. It might be attending an event. If those vanity metrics are not connected to a conversion metric, then they really are just navel gazing. They're, they're just vanity metrics. 
for, I can give one person, I'll give an example from a past uh, place. We had a social media campaign. And at one time there was a retweet from a, a very popular artist, which simply by that one retweet, by that one artist, allowed us to say that we had 11 million impressions on this campaign. Did it link back to donations? Whole other, that's a whole other question. And that's the question that should be asked. What you need to try and resist against your, what your gut might be telling you is that just because a number is big doesn't mean a number is good. Conversion metrics are harder to obtain. They are the, they are the, the long way around but the very necessary way around because it's gonna require you to do a little more legwork. So to be able to measure a conversion rate may mean that you need to make sure your email platform has a verified domain on your web, your website's domain, sorry, is verified on your email marketing platform. And that same domain uh, is verified on Google search console, the Google search console is linked to your analytics. Your analytics has cross domain tracking set up with your donation processing tool. These are, this is not uh, out of the box ready for you, but there are tons of resources available to help walk you through this. Google is very good at providing you all sorts of hands-on walkthrough resources to get some of these things linked, but it takes time. It takes time set aside to link these up so that you can start to generate reports and see how effectively your social media is converting into actual dollars in the door. You might actually get to a point where you can do a cost per conversion, e-commerce tracking, like e-commerce reporting in Google Analytics comes to mind that once you have it configured and, and functioning, you can actually start to see the amount of money that is processed on your page that came from Facebook that came from Twitter, that came from Instagram. Those are incredibly important. They start to tell you your advertising ROI and you could even start to measure things like lifetime value. So my recommendation is start here, start with the hard stuff first, because once you do, you can optimize with the vanity metrics. So start with conversion metrics, optimize with these. Many people do it the other way around. Avoidable mistake number two, betting on a single creative design. So when you're creating a, a social media campaign, trying to guess what creative is gonna work, it's near impossible. I've been doing this a long time. What we want to work and what actually works are not exclusively the same thing. And a lot of time and energy and money goes into creating a, a campaign and an assumption that because the creative director or the director of marketing really liked the way the logo looked on that image doesn't mean it's going to move people to action. So what you can do when you're running a, a paid campaign on a Facebook business manager, Facebook business suite, it's uh, slowly being migrated over to, you can run campaigns on Facebook and Instagram and on one campaign, one, one post, you can upload multiple versions of creative and the platform is going to serve different versions to different people over time. And it's gonna to optimize to show the most effectively converting ad to the most engaged audience. And it's gonna do so based on data. So this is what a data-driven strategy can really look like in social. So for, for example, I'm not a graphic designer, but I went into Canva and it took me about five minutes to make this hypothetical blood drive ad that the campaign message can be consistent. Give blood today save a life. How you visually bring that to life, you might be able to vary quite a bit. So we've got from the left, just two-tone variation in the middle, we've got stock image. And on the right, we've got like wild cards. Let's put a person's face in there. Let's put a mosquito in there. And let's put one in that doesn't have a tagline at all. And by putting all of these in there, you might actually find that while your director of marketing and communications or your pro bono ad agency handed you the one in the upper left and said, this is the best, this is the one, this is gonna work, this is beautiful, we're gonna go take this to the Can Lions, we're gonna win awards for this. They may say that and that's what they give to you, but in fact, you might find is the mosquito raises way more money and you, I would hope, feel empowered to say, we're going full mosquito 
we're gonna, this is this is the one because this is the one that converts. Moving right along, targeting the wrong people. You can target based on profiles and you can target based on behaviors. So behavior-based targeting means you're serving advertisements to people that know you already or they're actively looking for you. So these could be your current donors, it's your email list, maybe non-donors, people who have come to your website, people who have searched for your charity. So they have exhibited a behavior that you can then target them with your new advertisements based on that. So there should be no strangers here, whether it's the email that they provided, uh, the cookie, the first party cookie from them having visited your website, or the fact that Google is able to divine that they've searched for your charity for your cause in the past. Now that is quite different from profile-based targeting, which is the people who don't know you yet, but they might be interested. So they might just live near the food bank that you operate. They might follow the uh, food bank on the other side of town, or they might be friends of the people who already like you. So they, they don't know you yet, but they know that your, their uncle likes you. Behavior and profile, they're, they're quite different, but they often get, the avoidable mistake is that they often get blended together. So if you wanna reactivate people who have given in the past, or you wanna convert them to donors, or you wanna convert them from one-time donors to monthly donors, start with behavior-based targeting. This is a little trickier and these lists are going to be smaller. Your cost per click, your cost per view or impression might be a little higher in a paid campaign, but the return is also going to be much higher. Chances are your ROI at the end will be better. But if you are setting out to acquire brand new, net new donors who have never heard of you before, go profile-based targeting. Profile-based targeting is the easier of the two. This is the protein, the, no, this, is the, this is like the quick hit candy adrenaline rush that makes it very easy. Facebook makes it very easy for you to target just by somebody who lives in a postal code or who follows a similar charity, but you're not gonna get the results you need necessarily. Behavior-based targeting, this is your like protein and veg that is gonna make you stronger so you can go on to fight another day and, and run this marathon that is social media advertising and marketing, uh, but it's gonna require a little bit more of you. And if I, I've just been talking quite a bit about paid strategies. You may very well just be thinking, I don't have a budget for that. I, can, I can't pay a dollar to a social media campaign. Totally, I get it. You're, you're amongst, if you're in Canada, tens of thousands of other nonprofits in the same place. I would organize my organic strategies into two major categories, persistence or the hit or miss. What do I mean by that? So persistence is growth through consistency, not so different from the email recommendations I made earlier. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, these are channels that are reward and are built for consistency, to build community around consistency of engagement. And I think that you're gonna get returns over time, compounding returns over time. By being consistent, you will attract more engagement, you'll be growing your community. And when you need that community, you, you may very well be able to activate them for a very specific ask at a specific time. This is all on one side of the spectrum. On the other side of the spectrum is the hit or miss. This is when you just are hoping to achieve virality. This is when your, I'm doing it again, board members. This is when your board member says, you know what we need to do this year? We need to get on Ellen. I think Ellen may not be on TV, but this was a very real thing for about 15 years. If we could just get on Ellen, all our problems will be solved. Um, that is a hit or miss strategy. Uh, it's maybe it's good for Reddit, TikTok, Snapchat. Benefit is low risk. You know, you're like it's like telling a telling a bad inoffensive joke in a room. But the risk is that people, nobody laughs. But the reward can be very high. The reward can be high if the right people at the right time activate their respective communities. If a celebrity really does rally people to give, the reward is high. But it is not the strategy that you should start with. If the persistent strategy, persistent strategy is, is kind of like contributing to your RRSP. This is your, uh, direct, uh, your direct transfer off every paycheck going into your retirement fund. Hit or miss is like buying a lottery ticket. You have about the same chances of 
achieving vir virality. I worked for an organization called War Child Canada for quite some time. And we have, War Child Canada had uh, some amazing documentaries that it produced. We War Child eventually uploaded those to the YouTube channel. And every once in a while, and it probably still will in the future, some of those documentaries make it to the front of Reddit with a, did you know um, that some 41 went to the Congo and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it shows up on the front page. So I've seen this happen a few times and the attention is great, but it doesn't always translate to more fundraising. So even if you have hit, you have a whole other challenge of how do you translate that attention and interest into donations. Okay, deep breath, final thought. We've covered a few building blocks. I've done a lot of talking and I hope I'm gonna bring you, I wanna bring you all back to this, this idea that uh, I've presented you with a lot of information but we have still only scratched the surface. I've presented a few core channels that I think deserve your time and attention if what you wanna do is raise more money but how you connect them is going to be very, very specific to your organization and it should. That's what's going to make it engaging. That's what's going to build loyalty and trust. So I, I do wish you really well on your journey and I also would love to see what your journeys look like. Uh, you'll, you'll have my contact information after, but I love seeing how people connect it because it's unique every single time. And the digital world is constantly evolving. You, you might be tuning in and you've um, maybe you've just started in the job for the first time. So it's all relatively new to you. Maybe you've been doing this a very long time and you're trying to figure out what does this Brock guy have to say that's new. I don't know that I have much that's incredibly new. But because the world is constantly evolving, and when I say world, I mean like digital fundraising tools and social media tools, they're always evolving. You don't have to be an expert but tuning in just enough to be dangerous can go a very, very long way. And there's, a, there's an old thought experiment, ship of devious. You've probably heard this in some form, but it's the, there's, if, if a ship leaves harbor, let's say, and one by one boards are replaced and it arrives at the next harbor and every board has been replaced, is it a new ship or is it, or is it the same ship? Every single piece, top to bottom, has been replaced. It, the digital fundraising world, social media world, kind of feels like that. That if you disconnect for too long, the whole ship has been swapped out from under you, board board by board. So you can't hold your assumptions too closely or too tightly for too long in this space. So every once in a while, take a look at those analytics. If you don't, um, ask for some recommendations on email marketing tools or social media analytics platforms because the market of tech companies that are providing support here and tools here is very competitive and moving very fast. Like I said at the top, if I have a book, I'm, I hope I'm a pretty accessible person and you can reach out anytime and connect with me on LinkedIn or Twitter. Uh, but also if you want the deeper dive on each of these, I have a book and it's on, it's on Amazon. It's not hard to find. It's called From the Ground Up, Digital Fundraising for Nonprofits. You can get it in uh, any format, eBooks, audiobooks, paperback and like hardcover. If for, if for some reason you, want, you needed this as a hardcover, you, you can get that. Looks great, I've got one. And uh, here we are. So we, I think we, we managed to hit our time, Fatty. Not, not, too, not too bad. Yeah, but not too far off. off. So great job uh, for sure. And uh, yeah, thank you. I just want to start by saying thank you so much for for making this this presentation happen. Uh, yeah, I'm seeing a couple of people needing to hop off to other meetings. If you need to do that, that's okay. Um, I think I have a couple of questions for you to kick off the Q and A. And if others have any Q and A, they can uh, they can jump in. But my First question is about email lists, audiences, and organizing data. So we have like 
I don't know, like 2,100 subscribers, right? So 2,000 subscribers to our email list, but venture to impact has pivoted models and offerings and, and ways of connecting with the world to produce our impact multiple times over the last three years. And I find our mailing lists are starting to be like catch all uh, where it's not, we don't have the defined target audiences and the defined um, groups that we've once envisioned. So what's your best rec? And I think a lot of organizations have that where like you think all of this list is partners, but actually a couple of, you know, different audiences creep into this list or this list is supposed to be all volunteers or this is your catch-all list, but they're all just getting a little bit mangled or at least 75, 25%. So, so I'm just wondering if you have like any tips on that, if you think like, Hey, listen, just blast people with the relevant contacts for the partner, for the, for the audience that you think you're hitting and let everybody else unsubscribe. Or if, I don't know, if you have any other thoughts on the best way to organize lists when you're a few years down the road and you've pivoted a couple of times your offering and it's, it's gotten a little bit less clear um, than when you started. Yeah, that's, it's a, you described your very specific use case, but it actually, there are very, very similar versions of that. Charities, you know, that could look like a charity had a golf tournament three years ago and hasn't done it since. What do you, what do, you do with those with those people? Well, uh, maybe first, if it's helpful, just to set terms, you know, you talk about this list and this list and this list. A, a better practice is you have, you have one list and within that, and you, you this is maybe what you described, Betty, but you have one list and within that you have categories. Segments, right. Yeah, so that might, um, depending on the tool you're using, those could be smart groups or tags or groups or categories or segments. Point is you have one list so that if you were to hit send on the list, everybody gets it. And I think if you're struggling to understand what's relevant to those people, then I would say you keep keep moving forward, keep communicating, keep telling the honest truth about what you're doing and why you're doing it. And then let the engagement data tell you who's resonating and who's not. So you, you'll every no matter what platform you're using, you're going to get an unsubscribe number the next day. And if you see that unsubscribe number and it's, I don't know, fraction of a percentage, six people, six people and all of them were past partners. Uh, that's gonna that's gonna start to point you in the direction of actually you know that's maybe not going to be our most engaged audience. Uh, however, now let's let's make sure, let's um let's assume that everybody's maintaining you know full Castle compliance GDPR compliance and that like everyone's list is a is a list they have permission to contact. If that could be let's let's use that as a baseline assumption. The people who are not incredibly engaged on your list shouldn't be totally written off as of no marketing value or engagement value. They might actually be a really interesting place to test out some new messaging, to test out some new creative. I've done this in the past where we've had lists of very unengaged people who maybe didn't open the last four emails, which is not, not hard to segment on in your platform. Usually when you're creating, you can create conditions within your audience and send this to everyone who did not open last four emails. Like those are all fields that you could kind of conditionalize and link up. So if somebody didn't get the last four, then let's send them that, that wild idea that you just came up with while you're doing the dishes last night and see, and see what kind of engagement it gets. Because uh, upside is you've gained a really an interesting insight that could be folded up and into the larger email marketing program. And downside is they unsubscribe. And what your data was telling you before is that they're probably gonna unsubscribe anyways. I'm not a big fan of unsubscribing anyone on their behalf, unless your permission to contact them is, is expiring. That, that's the exception to that. But I wouldn't unsubscribe someone because it would reduce your list size so that you save $3 a month, so that you get like you fall under a pricing band. I think that's, that's a penny wise pound foolish. 
decision that's made. So I would say, keep pushing forward, get back to your, your core question, keep pushing forward, keep telling your stories. And I think that people will, who want to get on the bus are gonna get on the bus. And those who don't are gonna see themselves out. That's, that's actually really good and reaffirming advice. Uh, one other question I would have, and if others have questions, uh, you know, feel free to chime in is, um, I, I just feel like social is so hard for, for everything other than like awareness and credibility. Like when we first started doing our work, no one knew who we are, but we're going into corporate offices. We're telling our story directly to the employees and the CSR professionals that we wanted to enjoy uh, to engage. And our social was crap, but like we're getting the meetings, we're, we're raising the money, we're, we're doing the work. And for a lot of people, it didn't make any sense. It's like, why is your social media so bad? Why aren't you pushing out beautiful creative every single day? And it's like, well, because it takes so much time and I don't know how to convert it. Um, and so do you give permission to, to people to leverage a very small component of social. Like for us, when we first started, we were leading skill-based volunteering programs abroad. And all I wanted on social is to have reviews for people who went on a volunteer program and created impact to leave a review and, and tell other people how they felt. Was it safe? Did they actually create impact or was it about tourism? And, and so I just, I think if, if an organization is small, um, what is your like best like here's how you have social just for the sake of having social in case if someone searches you but not waste your time because it's literally so difficult to connect the dots unless like the funnel that you talked about is so well thought out and so okay with being so broad and then maybe six months down the road funneling into a $20 donation if you're never going to talk to them. Just curious about yeah. that. What permission yeah. can you give us small organizations? If when you if you've connected a dot, like you just said, there's there's connecting dots. If you connected, if you can only really connect one in a way that links to your objectives, business or charitable objectives otherwise, and in your case it's reviews leads to more referrals or referrals leads to more act uh, like active participation in the program. Yeah, engagement. Yeah. So you've connected, you've connected some dots there. You can drastically narrow the platforms that are going to support that objective of getting those reviews. So did, does TikTok do that? Probably not. Um, if you need reviews on a certain platform, then yeah, I would say get very specific with the platforms that you're using and you by no means have to be on every platform just because everyone else is on every other platform. Um, if you have a, a directive that you need to have a Twitter and an Instagram and a Facebook and another, then you can put a few on somewhat on autopilot, which is to say you focus your, the bulk of your creative and intellectual capital on the platform that you know best supports your business objective. Referrals, event attendance, you name it. You should put the, everything there and then you you just repurpose that content for the others. It's like you recycle that content for the others. Canva, I know you're a Canva tool, Fatty. I'm a Canva, you're a Canva fan of the tool, Fatty, so am I. <laughs> it makes it very, very, it makes it very, very easy to repurpose it's free for server. nonprofits. You can apply for a yes. free license. It's you can get the pro version. Canva is, is your best friend if you're trying to do something scrappy. Yeah, don't don't uh, convince yourself that you're not because you're not a graphic designer. You can't make nice, simple, shareable graphics. Canva provides tons of templates that you can swap out your brand colors, swap in your brand fonts, and so put your put your creative energy, eighty percent of your creative energy and time into the piece of content for the platform that closest links to the business objective. And then everything else is just a, a reformatting of it. And you might push there, but you're only putting 20% of your time and energy there. Uh, and then maybe just on this, because I think it relates is thinking really 
finding time, please find time to think critically about what your really like core value offering might be as an organization. You know, arts organizations have really um, immersive experiences that they might be able to offer that another charity can't. Um, another charity might have really engaged students who can tell really personal stories. And so when you think of, find what it is that might set you apart from a, a marketing strategy and standpoint and go hard on, on that. Uh, because I, 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 not just me, it is a common mistake for startups, nonprofit or profit that there's, there's often early success, you know, friends and friend, the friends and family bump early on uh, that momentum can carry into quick scaling as your product really takes shape. But if you fail to differentiate yourself from a marketing standpoint, not just from a product value standpoint, that's where you might find yourself plateauing. And sometimes you don't know that you've plateaued until a little too much time has passed. And so finding, finding ways to differentiate your, your marketing voice and your targeting strategies and the way what you ask people to do your your value exchange some people would call it like the one pager that gathers emails that brings people into a welcome series refining that over time that's what's going to keep you from plateauing or get you out of a plateau i i think that's uh so incredibly powerful is the finding your value prop or finding your unique offering as, as an organization. And one really practical way to do that is also to ask people uh, that engage with your organization. So when COVID hit, we were uh, only offering skill-based volunteering programs abroad. And we we're like, okay, well, we can't travel, but we still have this amazing community of corporate professional, amazing community of uh, nonprofits, amazing community of volunteers, what do we do? And so we went to all of them and said, how does Venture to Impact support you today? What are the gaps that you have? And what do you think we can do and to fill those? And based on that, we've crafted a completely new value prop that's not kind of geo uh, specific or function specific, but it's specific around human centered design to solve complex problems leveraging the communities that we have. So just want to encourage people that if you don't know how to get there, ask others because they typically have a lens in which they see you from. And that lens could support your own vision of yourself and, and help you connect the dots internally and externally to get there. Brock, final thoughts. If you have like a thought, we're coming on to Giving Tuesday, fundraising season. If there's like one thought that you want to give people in closing, what do you, what do you say? Get that Giving Tuesday email out there. It's it's not too late. Asking asking might be feels like the hardest part for some, and they don't know where to start. But I I assure you, once you sit down and you put pen to paper, key to screen, it will come. You know your cause better than anyone else. Give people the opportunity to support because it would be foolish to not allow them or give them the opportunity to support the really great work that you're doing. So Giving Tuesday is around the corner. If you're seeing this live, go for it. Um, but if you're not, if you're watching this on recording, there's gonna be something else. Earth Day is coming. Uh, Day of the Girl Child is coming. A summit is coming. There's something is coming that you may not have a fundraising ask planned for. Plan for it, do it, pat yourself on the back for it, learn from it. And I'll um, only for just the last moment, because I know we have, we do have, I, slight minute. I just want to give a sneak peek to anyone who might still be tuning in. Um, are you seeing my screen? Resume share. So I just want to show anyone who's tuned in behind this, there are extras. So if the PDF comes through, I've got all sorts of homework in here. I did want to make this practical. I know I did a lot of talking, but I want to make this practical. Some homework. Uh, if you're, if what I was skimming through on the analytics and the Google front might be, here are five questions you can pass along to them. If SEO is of interest or mysterious to you, I've got some free resources here. If you're getting new, if you're new to email marketing, stay out of that spam folder, here they are, freebies, a whole storytelling. This is an entire section that is a bonus. Of, um, if you don't even know, if you think you're not a writer and you don't know how to write a story, 
here's a good starting point. I hope this is all helpful. Thanks again, everybody, for, for tuning in. No, I 